Uh, hi, Dave here again. Welcome to my videos. I haven't done one in a while. It's uh, been a while since I've done a, a train video. I did some other videos, but uh, anyway, uh, I have one something important to show. And I've what I've done is I've been given a task, <clears throat> actually a really great opportunity to build a railroad for someone, which I you know I've done a few in the past, but I haven't done one in a long time. But this one is like very extensive railroad. And uh, I'm not at liberty to say where it is because of circumstances. But in, in any event, the suggestion was made to make a dual gauge, meaning seven and a quarter and seven and a half. And the reason being is that where this railroad is located, it's right in the heart of the seven and a quarter gauge area of the United States, obviously in New England area. And the suggestion was that if we make it seven and a half, we have better opportunity to buy equipment that's for sale somewhere in the United States because three quarters of the United States is seven and a half gauge. And the new Northeast area, uh, New Jersey, uh, although there is isolated places where there are seven and a half gauge tracks, um, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, New York State, uh, Connecticut, uh, all of the New England states is all seven and a quarter gauge. And the rest of the country is seven and a half. And th there's a reason why that happened. But to finish what I was saying, the idea was, the suggestion was that we make it seven and a half gauge, but be able to run seven and a quarter gauge trains on the same track. Now, this has been successful, successfully done by Nick Edwards down in Texas. It's well known, and along with Bob Hornsby, who helps him maintain the railroad. So I got to credit those two guys, and I believe the guy who actually did the work or the design was the na guy's name was Goff. Uh, I think it was Henry. I think so. I'm not sure, but anyway, Bob, you can correct me on that. Uh, uh, so anyway, it's been done, but I wanted to do it uh, here, and I wanted to set up my own idea, find, learn how to work it, and learn what I need to do for the design, and uh, I've done that now. Now the gauge here is going to be 7 and 9 sixteenths, that's what it has to be. But before we get into that, I want to explain why there's two different gauges in this country. Uh, my K4 is in the other room here. Uh, I designed it built it, made the patterns, did everything. That could be either gauge. It's designed for both gauges. When I was interested in selling it, someone says, oh, what do you have to do? Put a block in between the cylinders? No, I made it wider. I made it wider so it'll take the gauge. It makes sense, huh? Right, same thing with these trucks. Now these trucks right here, right now, are seven and a quarter gauge. So what you have to do is when you make the thing, you have to make the side frames out far enough to accept the seven and a half gate. And then of course there's a spacer if you want to put it in between. All right, back to the reason why. Okay. What I heard, and this is kind of like a, not, nothing really, no one really, really, truly knows the, the, uh, the real explanation to it, why, why it happened. But, well, the first one I want to say that New England, uh, not New England, England, the UK, Great Britain, whatever you want to call it, whatever suits your purpose for today, Great Britain, England, the UK, they got like a lot of names. Uh, yeah, so whatever you want to call it over there in jolly old, across the pond, as they say, um, that is seven and a quarter gauge. I think most of Europe is seven and a quarter gauge. Australia is seven and a quarter gauge. New Zealand is seven and a quarter gauge. I, I'm not sure about the other places in the world. Okay, seven and a quarter gauge started here because it came from England. Locomotives came. Um, Bassett Loke made uh, uh, Royal Scott seven and a quarter gauge. They had a, a bunch of them made. They're all seven and a quarter gauge. Um, I don't know the year, but we're talking probably before World War II. But there was a guy, his name was Lester Friends. Friends, I think is what it is. 
and uh, he had a company called Yankee Shops and he was in Marblehead, Massachusetts and he made a lot of three-quarter inch scale, one inch scale and then later in years he went to inch and a half scale in the 50s. Now little engines, which you all know, you know, they were like the biggie, bolt, bolt them together, B-O-L-T dash E-M together, uh, which is, yeah, we'll get into that another day. But um, Martin Lewis, who was the owner of Little Engines, who started Little Engines, this is what I heard. Now this is a story, I might be wrong, anybody can correct me, I don't care. What I heard was that Martin Lewis, or it might even, might even have been Seymour Johnson, who was building his Northern at the time through Little Engines, wrote Friends a letter. And Lester Friend typed it, you know, and the gauge is, boom, seven and a quarter. But if you remember the old typewriter, anybody old time typewriter, Remington and all that, the, the key for the quarter and the half is on the same key. And there's a, you have to hit the register, the, the, is that what they call it? The shift. Right? Shift, yeah, the shift. You hit the shift button to get the quarter. And I think he forgot to hit the shift button and he said, well, the gauge is seven and a quarter, but seven and a half came on a letter. He probably didn't check it. Send the letter off. Oh, okay, we're gonna make a seven and a half gauge. And blah, 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 blah. The other thing I heard was that um, Seymour, who was a really good friend of mine, by the way. Uh, I, I attended his 90th birthday party. Uh, so I believe Seymour, I believe Seymour had a seven and a half, uh, a 15 inch gauge railroad. And that was another thing. He took 15 inch gauge, which is not right either. And he cut it in half, which is seven and a half. So that's another story I heard. The third one, and to tell you the truth, makes the most sense to me, is the one that Keith Taylor told me many years ago. Now, I haven't talked to Keith in a while, but he's a very knowledgeable person when it comes to these little trains. And he had given me a, and I want to, if he's watching this, uh, he had given me a um, book years and years ago, got to be 35, 40 years ago, called Little Railways of the World. And I cherish that book. It's one of my favorite books of all time. And it talks about all miniature railroads throughout the country. Now, there was a guy that wrote that book. His name was Shaw. And he had a seven and a quarter gauge railroad running on eight pound rail, which is about yo high. Uh, that was like the smallest rail built, and I had a lot of it one time. Anyway, um, somebody wrote him a letter and said, well, what is the gauge? And he went out and he measured the gauge. But he was also, I believe, a guy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Keith, if you watch this, uh, it was something to do with Lionel trains. Now, I'm going to go on the board, and I'm going to write something here and kind of show you. Uh, all right, we're going to put a tie. Here's a tie. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And then Lionel track, okay? It's like a tubular track. And then, of course, they got one in the middle, right? All right, now, when you measure Lionel trains, they measure it from the center, is what I understand, for the gauge. The center of the rail. And I think it's inch and a quarter. I think for O gauge. Okay, so what Shaw did, he went out to measure his railroad, and here's the, the track on his fault as a square, because it's like a railhead, right? Can you see this okay? Yes. Okay. And he measured it in the center of the track, which now was seven and a quarter between the rails, but on the top, because of the thickness of the the, the, the thickness of the head of the track. He got come out with seven and a half. So that's what he told him. Now he told him it was seven and a half gauge. But in reality, between these two rails, it was seven and a quarter. All right. So that's what I believe happened. I don't know which story is true, but in any event, we're stuck with it. So... As a designer, 
locomotive designer and rolling stock designer for my business, Mercer Locomotive, I have to design for both. I have to design for both because I'm selling all over the world. So I've sold both seven and a quarter gauge and both seven and a half gauge, and they all work fine. And um, we're stuck with it. Now, when it comes to the track, the regular track without the switches, it'll work anywhere. Seven and a quarter. But when it comes to the switches, it doesn't work because of the frog. Now, you know, this is a frog. This is a big one. This is a number 11. And uh, the problem is in, in this area here. When the, when the wheels come through, if they're too narrow, too wide, they won't go through. Okay, so what I've done is I made this, I took this frog here, which is a number nine, and we'll talk about that in a minute, how you get those numbers. Um, and I widened it out. I, wi I widened the slot out to nine sixteenths of an inch. Okay? And the gauge is seven and nine sixteenths. Now, everybody out and their brother is making this gauge at seven and five eighths. Look, I don't care what you tell me, it's too wide. It's just entirely too wide. It's not necessary to be that much wider. And I'll show you why. This right here is a seven and a half gauge set of wheels. Now I put it on this gauge track and you already got a sixteenth wide to begin with. Look, you got a lot of play already. Why would you need more? So anyway, it's not necessary to have a seven and five eighths track. It's way, way too big. Now, especially if you're gonna have this dual gauge thing going on. If you guys wanna make it seven and three quarters, go right ahead. It's totally ridiculous. Now, let's talk about, and we're gonna get, we're gonna get back to that in a moment. We're gonna talk about gauges, what I mean by gauge, all kind of gauges. There's a pressure gauge, there's a this kind of a gauge, there's that kind of a gauge, water gauge, glass gauge, gauge, gauge. Well, to gauge to put on a track here to get the get the distance between. That's also a gauge. I'm gonna tell you about that in a minute. But let's talk about frogs. Now, frogs. How do you determine what the number of the frog is? Well, it's real simple. And we'll go back over here to the classroom. And we'll go like this here. Here's the point. I'm just going to draw the center part. All right, and then that's the part. In fact, you know what I'll do? I'll put it here in black. That's this part right here. Okay. What you do is you go down with a ruler, and here's a ruler, in case you don't know what a ruler is. And you go down and you go to where it says one inch wide. So let's say it's right here. Right there. All right, so you take your other ruler, go this way now, and you measure from here to here to here. here and it says nine inches that is a number nine frog and according 11 five seven whatever it measures that's how you measure a frog okay, okay so now back to what we we're talking about let's see okay gauges now we're going to talk about track gauges now what I did I just took this steel here because I was only making a mock-up here. This, okay, what this is here is a gauge I made out of just a piece of steel. This is a smaller one than this one. Okay, this, this is a, we're going to talk about gauges now. This is a gauge, actually, it's just a piece of steel I cut to 7 and 9 sixteenths. Oh, actually, it's this one. A little bit of play. You're allowed some. All right, but... In reality, most guys take a piece like this, they cut two notches in it to fit over the head of the rail. That couldn't be the worst case scenario. 
worst. And this is why. All right, now, of course, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of flack about this. Everybody, you know, we built 17,000 miles of track, you know, and uh, uh, we got uh, we got train mound, we got 35 miles of track there, guys, you know. All right, anyway, look. Here's the track. Woo, one rail. Here's the other rail. I don't care what the gauge is. You put it in this way, which is perpendicular, it's going to be right. But if you guys, I'm exaggerating, if it's a little bit cocked like that, this distance is shorter now. Because this now becomes the hypotenuse, and this becomes the base of the angle. So if you figure it out, this angle is different than that. This is 90, and this is whatever. So this becomes smaller here. Now... We don't want this situation, so what we'll do is, and I'm going to make a curve, I'm going to show a curve. I don't care what the radius is, it doesn't matter what the radius is right now. Okay, that's a curve. And we're going to put what's called a Y gauge, I'm going to show it as a U. Alright, now we're going to draw a bigger. I'm going to draw bigger here. I'm going to draw a little bit less curve. And we're going to draw it bigger. And now we're going to have a block on this end, a block on that end, and this end here, this is going to look like this. It's a flat part and then a block and then the rails in here. And this one's going to have the key on top of it like, like you would for the flat gauges that you guys make. Alright, now Here's what happens. Back to that. I don't know if you guys, if you ever took geometry, I hope you did if you're engineers. Here's the curve again. It'll make it a little bit bigger. Alright, and your track gauge, and it'll go like that. Now, between here, X and X, is a straight line. Now, if you have this at say 10 inches, and of course this is a, now this is set at the gauge from this point to this point at the gauge, it's going to make a gap in there, right in here. See that? That's this straight line is the cord. Now, let's take a, a picture of that bigger. And of course, you know, like that, this gap on, for 60 foot, this is going to be 40 thousandths. So it automatically, automatically widens the gauge as you go around the turn. The sharper the turn, the more it opens.